and to say, good idea. However, you can work out the numbers. In order to produce a signal that we could uh, detect with our present SETI experiments looking at the galactic center would require that their transmitter have a power of 5 times 10 to the 17 watts. That's a 5 followed by, uh, you know, 17 zeros there. That, that's a big number. In fact, that's more than all the sunlight following on the Earth. Uh, and, and, and indeed, to put that in perspective, uh, if you work that out in kilowatt hours, right, that's 10 to the 18th kilowatt hours is what I worked out. And you pay here to PG&E for a kilowatt hour, you pay about 10 cents. And they're trying to give you the cheapest electricity they can. They do it by doing things like burning coal and, 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 and you know, natural gas and so forth. They try and make it as inexpensively as they can. So at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, this transmitter, to produce a signal that we could find here two-thirds of the way out in the galaxy, would cost um, one million billion dollars a year. Okay. Now, I never begrudge the aliens, you know, money or energy or things like that, but that sounds like a lot to me. One million billion dollars a year. Sounds improbable. Okay, so the idea of a galactic beacon saying join our book club or whatever, centered at the you know the middle of the Milky Way, you could do it, but it's extraordinarily energy expensive. Okay. So summarizing this little argument so far, I don't think they're going to be targeting Earth relentlessly with a signal because they just don't know we're here. Okay. And on the other hand, while they may be broadcasting to the entire Milky Way, maybe there's a, a galactic GPS system, right, or, or, or something like that. Maybe the weather report for the Milky Way, right, is being broadcast. The facts are that to do it at a level that we could detect is very expensive. So where are we? What, how do we deal with this? Well, we could, I say be smarter. I'm not sure that it's smarter, but we, we could think of some other ideas. One way to do that is to simply say, look, it's not going to be that strong a signal. Right? Because the 10 to the minus 25 watts per meter square, which is the number I gave you at the beginning, as that's how sensitive our uh, experiments are, that's what we can do 100 years after Marconi. We just invented radio. Right? Now, the aliens, you know, they may assume that the invention of radio is as far in our past as, you know, the invention of the wheel. And, you know, you probably don't remember who invented the wheel. His name was Rodney, by the way. But, you know, you don't remember much about that story, and yet you use the wheel every day. And they may say, you know, if, if they're 10,000 years ahead of us, they're not going to assume that our radio technology is at the level that it is. We will clearly have done much better, and consequently their transmitters will be more attuned to what they think is reasonable at this end. And they may consider antennas that are measured in tens, hundreds, or even thousands of feet as not particularly reasonable. Well... Are we going to be able to build a, a receiving system that can do much better than what we do today? Well, quoting Yogi Berra, I think Yogi Berra said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Actually, it's also possible that it was Niels Bohr who said this, but, you know, Niels Bohr, Yogi Berra, <laughs> what's the diff? Um, let's see if we could go for weaker signals. Well, this is one way we can go for weaker signals, building bigger antennas, and, of course, we're going to do that. This is an artist's rendition of the square kilometer array which will have 10 times the collecting area of the one down in Puerto Rico. So that's pretty big. And with, with the, something like that, you could obviously push the power requirement at the other end down by a factor of 10. So instead of $100 million billion dollars a year of electricity, it's only $10 million billion dollars of electricity. I, I don't know that that helps a whole lot. Um, but I point out that there's an interesting aspect to this kind of technology. Radio antennas of the future, radio telescopes of the future may not have these, you know, dishes. They may, they may not. But when you have a dish, you know, a physical 3D structure like that, then the cost of each antenna goes as any dimension cubed, obviously. Okay, but if you have flat antennas, and it may be possible to do these all as some sort of substrate, and you just have a whole bunch of dipoles on the ground, then, then the cost per element only goes up as the square of any given dimension. And that, that might be a real win there. But in any case... Here's sort of the bottom line on all this stuff. What I've done here is I've just taken a bunch of my favorite radio telescopes and uh, plotted them on this plot uh, as to how, how much collecting area they have. And so this was, you know, one of the first ones built by an amateur, Grota Reber in, in Wheaton, Illinois, back in the 1930s. And there's a square kilometer array. You know, that date is more or less there, but you can shake that, that thing around. And you can see some other telescopes in there. Now, the point is, they're getting bigger. At least on average, they get bigger. The bigger, biggest ones get bigger. And uh, this is a least squares fit plot there. And you may or may not believe it. But what it shows is that over the course of 100 years, 
the antennas have gotten about 100 times bigger. Okay. So, you know, every, every 100 years, every century, you get two orders of magnitude improvement. Now, you may not believe that, but that seems to be the case. Uh, I'll give you an optical example. On Mauna Kea in Hawaii now, Caltech and others are building the 30-meter telescope. Okay, it's, they haven't actually broken ground on it, or maybe they have, but you know, most of the ground is still there. <laughs> 30 meters across, a mirror 30 meters across. For comparison, 400 years ago, Galileo built a telescope with a 3-centimeter aperture. In fact, it was probably smaller than that because in the old days they would stop the lens down. You know? In other words, that's a factor of a million improvement in size in 400 years. Right, so that's six orders of magnitude in 400 years. That's not too much different than two orders of magnitude in a, in a century or so. I mean, you know, so you get orders of magnitude improvement over the course of a few centuries. Right? So that suggests that when we get a little bit farther down the line here, we could build an antenna that was big enough to find the kinds of signals that would be pretty cheap to broadcast to the entire galaxy. Okay? Uh, this, this is an example with the, the square kilometer array, but you could get down to this sort of sensitivity, and that means that the aliens would be able to broadcast a signal we could pick up with only 10 to the 13 watts. And 10 to the 13 watts is still a lot. That's 10 trillion watts. But actually, humanity consumes somewhat more than that already. So, you know, it's, it's now getting to a level where you think, you know, a really advanced society might be able to afford something like that. So that's one way to do it. We just sit around for a couple of hundred years and then do the experiment again. Needless to say, this isn't very interesting, okay? But the other possibility is to do what's actually uh, proposed here, and that is to take an antenna, the bigger the better, and just aim it all the time at the galactic center, for example, for a year and just beat down the noise. You would gain a couple of orders of magnitude over current limits if you did that. And maybe that's enough to, to give you success, and maybe not, but it strikes me as something that's worth trying. In other words, a very highly sensitive search of at least one spot on the sky, and that spot on the sky, I, I would think, would be the, uh, the galactic center. By the way, this harkens back to the uh, idea of Barney Oliver, known to many of you in the audience. He was the R&D director at uh, Hewlett-Packard for its first 20-some years. Uh, Barney Oliver was, in the 1970s, proposing that we ought to build a, a huge array of antennas to try and uh, find ET. But, you know, unfortunately, you have these artist impressions that sort of scared everybody off because that looked expensive, okay? And uh, I'm sure, in fact, it was expensive. There were, you know, these billions of dollars. But on the other hand, that was that sort of a misconstrued what his idea there was. His idea was, look, you build one antenna and, and you do the experiment. And if it doesn't work, you build four or, and then you build maybe 16 and so forth. That you just keep building it until it works. And that way, you never build more than you need, okay? Which I thought was a clever approach. Hasn't been done. Okay. Here's another way we might approach SETI. This is just, you know, to get your creative juices going. Special cases. I mean, like special cases. Uh, this is an idea that goes back a ways, uh, primarily uh, espoused by Guillermo Le Marchand, who is uh, an Argentinian astronomer and physicist. Uh, and here's the way it goes. It, it turns out that, although he wrote a lot of papers about this, it turns out that 20 years earlier, the Russians had already thought of it. But actually, when you look into any idea in SETI, it turns out that the Russians had always thought of it earlier. And, you know, the, 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 the interesting thing about that is that it's usually true, too, by the way. They, they really did. They were very clever. I see the Russians didn't have a whole lot of money for equipment, so they would sit around with pencils and papers, and they were very smart. Still are, actually. Okay, so the, the deal is suppose some supernova goes off, you know, in our galaxy, nearby galaxy. Bam, big explosion. Right, well, the astronomers, here's some alien planet there. Right, so the astronomers on that alien planet, they wake up. They go, wow, well, like supernova. And, you know, that, that means we can get uh, maybe... Uh, you know, some PhD theses for the grad students here, whatever. Maybe I can get tenure if I write something up. So they, all the telescopes on that world are aimed at that supernova for a couple of days, a couple of weeks. They study the heck out of it. But one guy, you know, is clever enough to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he waits half a day, and he just sends a signal out in the direction opposite to the supernova. Okay? Now, here we are on Earth, and at some point, you know, who knows what that, that signal is, you know, high, where the... Klingons, and we'd like to meet you. Okay, so here's Earth. 